Hello, everybody. It's Dana Brooks of Basic Brooks Personal Injury Lawyers, and you are back for another episode of the Empower Hour brought to you by the Empower Plant. We have an exciting show today. We have got Healthy Heather. If you're around Tallahassee, you have heard of Healthy Heather. She helps so many people just kind of get on the right path and maybe think outside the box and consider things they maybe haven't considered before. Take, take advantage or take assessment of all the resources they have available to them and just get on the right path for the life they wanna live. So uh, she's a coach, but hey, she's a lot more than that, y'all. She is a reporter. She's just an all around terrific person. She has a wonderful podcast. I've been uh, privileged to be a guest on it a couple of times. So first of all, welcome Heather and tell us your story real quick before I- Oh, I wow. Well, thanks. I am delighted to be here and get to, to spend some time in the Empower Hour. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, been in Tallahassee for about 25 years and started out um, working in nonprofit management and uh, you know just trying to get to know people and get to know this community and as a lot of people do um, have the little side gig of passion work um, that over time um, I have turned into my actual full-time work, which is working as a national board certified health and well-being coach, um, as well as a writer and, um, and publishing my podcast, Heather Solves Everything. So I try to do the best that I can to um, help everybody have the tools that they need to live a healthy, balanced life. Okay. Tell me what your, uh, motivation for the name of your podcast is Heather Heather solves everything but you have a little tagline you say after that well you know I I started out my podcast as a as a an answer to some of the freelance writing that I was doing focusing on nonprofit organizations in Tallahassee that were doing big things with teeny tiny budgets and I wanted to um, extend the conversations that I was having with them for some freelance writing that I was doing in conjunction with the Beatitude Foundation um, headed up by Rick Carney. Mm -hmm. And so um, I decided to take um, to the microphone and the, the fun uh, little twist of the show is Heather Solves Everything, where I take credit for solving your problems by introducing you to people who actually can. <laughs> <laughs> Because honestly, I can't really solve everything, obviously, but, you know, every, whenever we find any solution to a problem, it's something that we do together. And so um, it's a little tongue in cheek reference to um, me taking credit for solving everybody's problems. Um, but at the end of the show, we always, um, you know, give thanks to a little help from our friends, because that's how everything of importance gets done. I love that. Uh, you you have had wonderful people on your podcast because I think you understand or you appreciate the fact that you, you don't know everything, obviously, and you can't give uh, one person everything they need. And why should you when you have all these other people available to bring in and get their input? Uh, much like what we do here on the Empower Hour, while we started the Empower Plant, you know, we, we were worried, oh, what if we have to maintain this website? What if we're too busy to post? That thing blossomed and grew on its own. There's so many wonderful supportive people in our community online and uh, locally who just want to help other people or get some help and just raise up the collective and, and see everybody succeed. So I want to start with welcoming our panel. Uh, we have got, let's see, we got Kia Thomas back. Kia is our PR director. Welcome back. Hello, everyone. Uh, we've got Kimmy Hogan, my law partner. She's back. Hey. Yeah, and we've got Betsy Brown, uh, Maverick. What do you want? <laughs> she had some earphones. She had on a headset. <laughs> we thought she was getting ready to leave and go become a fighter pilot. She's motivated to to um, be her best self. So welcome everybody. Hey. Um, Heather Fuselag is your name, and if anybody <laughs> wants healthy Heather's contact. Um, you can always get it through us at the show and I'll make sure, uh, or us at the firm, um, and we'll also make sure she gives it out to you. But um, start, Heather, by telling us what motivates you to help other people? You know, I, I can't not do it. Um, it's something that I, I do just because it's in my nature to, to try to, to help people connect with either the internal motivation or the external resources that they need to achieve 
whatever it is, you know, I work in health and well-being and, um, you know, I focus a lot on life balance and identifying your priorities and really creating boundaries in life so that you can protect, you know, what you need for your own self-worth and, and self-care. Um, but honestly, I just love when somebody is successful. I love that feeling of, of, of watching somebody achieve something that they didn't know or didn't think that they could do. And that's just really fun for me. And it, it turns out that I, I actually have skills to be able to help in that process. And so anytime I can help somebody over a bridge or be a place where they can kind of get their bearings for a little bit and then go back out into the world, I just enjoy being able to do that. And, and thankfully I'm, I'm, a, I'm alive during a time when that's a job that people can do and that's valued and, and like, that's a thing. Yeah, uh, uh, everybody on the panel I'll tell you, we have coaches. Yeah. We have uh, marketing management co coaches, we have finance coaches. Um, and I always say this, I say coaching is hot right now because it works, yeah. you know, things, things don't you know, become sustainable if they're not really uh, doing what they say they will do. Um, I have a few questions and I'm gonna take it around. Uh, number one is what the hell is a coach? Is there a training? Is it a mandated, is it a regulated thing? What do you have to do to become a coach? And who are your typical clients? Not by name, obviously, but kind of demo. You know, I'm really glad that you asked what is a coach because coaching, we think that coaching has really evolved over the past 10 years that I've been in business to where now almost anybody can call themselves a coach and show up and say, I'm a, I'm a mindset coach. I'm an intuitive coach. I'm a lifestyle coach. And the term is not well regulated. Mm -hmm. And so I always caution and encourage people to seek out credentials. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on the type the area of your life where you're interested in working with a coach, there's going to be a credentialing organization that sets standards and has um, a, a minimum of, of education and experience for people to be really um, called, you know, and, and be able to hold themselves out as a coach. In my business, that is the national board certification. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for somebody to help you with life balance and health and well-being goals, you want that person to be certified by the national board certification, you know, have a national board certification designation. Yeah. Um, and then if you're working in, in a corporate setting, you know, if you're looking for a leadership coach or an executive coach, you want to really do your homework and make sure that that person has been to a credentialed and distinguished organization that's legitimate right. and that they have some actual experience working in that field. Gotcha. Now tell me who your typical clients are. Are you working with mostly women, mostly men, millennials, midlife, later in life transitioning, or is it all over the place? It, it sometimes, you know, it goes in waves. It seems like the same type of people seek me out at the same time. And so right now that is women who are kind of like me, you know, women in mid forties, you know, maybe, you know, starting to transition into a different career, they're getting their kids out of the house and now suddenly they've got time and they've lost track of who they are. You know, maybe like, you know, 15 years later, they're ready to lose the baby weight. And so, you know, it's a lot of women who are at this phase of life where they're realizing, okay, I can focus on myself again. And I don't even know what that means. And, and that's a lot of fun because, well, I mean, the possibilities are just almost endless. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think some of it is giving people permission to envision a life uh, that they they just never thought of because they were so, you know, entrenched in what they were doing on the daily uh, that it never occurred to them. I just came back from Belize. I went to this women's retreat, and one of our exercises was you know just remove all barriers, remove all limitations. What are three things you might do? if there was nothing holding you back yep. and man, what people came up with was pretty radical. It's things like relocate, live in another place, 
uh, changed my entire career. And these are people who are, you know, doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, very well invested uh, in, in what they've done. So very interesting. Let's get yeah. to um, let's get to our panel. I've talked enough. Um, who wants to go first? I'd like to go first. Kimmy. Hey, Heather. Hey. So I want to know when someone comes to you, what is that first appointment like? What type of questions are you asking? What are you trying to figure out so that you can start leading the person to whatever path they're going down? Well, you know, it's, it's right in line with what Dana was just talking about with the women's retreat that she went to in Belize. You know, we've, we, that first session is all about the vision. And I do not let anybody pass go until we have a strong vision of what it is that you want to bring into your life. And there, it needs to have some, some structure around it. And so I'm asking for, you know, the pie in the sky idea. What have you always dreamed of? What, what did you think life was going to turn out to be? You know, what have you decided you want it to be? And then we, we check it against the reality of, okay, so what can actually happen in the life that you're living now? You know, so sometimes you'll hear like, I would relocate, I would live on a tropical Island and sell, you know, coconuts to, you know, <laughs> make, make clothing. <laughs> Like, okay, so that might not be realistic for the life that you're living now, but what is it about that idea that is so appealing to you? And how can we infuse that into the life that you're living now? I love so that. that first session is about just really thinking big and bold, but then giving it a reality check so that we come up with something that is exciting, gives you goosebumps, gives you butterflies, and you can actually do. And yeah. that is what we start with. And we always go back to that whenever there, we hit any type of obstacle, whenever something's not working, we go back to that vision and ask, are we, are we still working towards this or have we gotten mm -hmm. off the path? So yeah. that's the first step. I love that. What are some questions that you ask though to get people thinking about that pie in the sky idea? Because for example, so I'm 36 years old, I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. So I'm at the beginning of that journey where a lot of people lose themselves because we're just totally consumed with work and children and family. Yeah. Um, and that's not all bad. I'm enjoying all of that. But right. I think if you were to ask me that question, I might have to sit and think for a long time because I'm it, my the time that I spend dreaming, it's been forever. You know, I've been I've been focused on school. I've been focused on family. So what kind of questions do you ask to get those juices flowing so people can kind of identify what they want? Ooh, I feel yeah, a yeah. workshop coming on. I feel a workshop coming on. You know, there's a variety of ways to ask to get to that information. And, you know, one of them, there's a lot of different exercises that I like to do. Um, you know, normally I would, I would have sent some questions ahead of time for you to think about so that you're not on the spot of like, tell me all your dreams right now. You know, you have a time to, to kind of start thinking about what that might be. But then also, um, you know, a, a classic coach question, if I could give you a magic wand to wave over your life, what would you create right now? And I typically that question is, what would you change? I prefer to ask, what would you create? because we're not necessarily wanting to change something about our lives. Like you said, you're enjoying the life that you have, but what would, what might you create in addition to that? Or what might you like to have waiting for you down the road? Another exercise that I always enjoy is um, postcard to yourself. You know, so if you, if you imagine being in your future life, you know, what you might consider to be your vision and then reflect back and write a letter to yourself now and describe that place, describe that setting, you know, talk about, you know, this is such a great place to be. This is how I spend my time. And this is what I'm really enjoying. And, you know, this is what I'm really glad that I made a priority so that you can start envisioning what you need to do now to get to that place. Does that make sense? Yes, I love it. I love it. That's a great thought exercise. I'm, I'm another gonna... <laughs> one, another one for when you're having a hard time with that. Imagine that you're talking to a friend and you're encouraging a friend to go after what she wants. Oh, that's a great. It's so that's much that's easier right. to encourage somebody yeah, else. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the words just come right out, right? You need to take time for yourself. You need to have date night. You need to, you know, you need to <laughs> tell somebody else. <laughs> that's a, that's wonderful advice. That's wonderful. Absolutely. You must be good at what you do. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing it for a while. 
<laughs> um, you do, um, since we promoted this and people knew you, you would be coming on the show, I heard a few people say, oh, she comes to our office. So um, tell me about like corporate coaching versus individual corp, uh, coaching. Yeah, they're really two completely different elements of my business. And I'm really glad to get to work in both of those because one-to-one -one coaching is just really rewarding and fun. But corporate well-being and employee well-being is, is just, oh my gosh, that's just like your heart sings when you walk into an organization that's thriving, where people are having fun, where my goal as working with an organization is that where you spend time working is a, is a place that makes your life better. Mm -hmm. You know, not a place that, that takes away from your life. That's your soul. Yes. Yes. And um, so I really enjoy working with small businesses to help them to create employee well-being programs that help the individuals working there to be able to have to first know that their employer truly cares about their well-being and isn't isn't just concerned with their output and their productivity. Sometimes yeah. we hear corporate well-being as everybody's going to be more productive and you're going to make more money because they're going to be healthier. And it's like, well, that's a nice to have trickle down benefit of when you invest in people and you actually care about them. So my work is getting to go into organizations and finding out you know, what's it like to work here? What are your pain points? Where are people stressed? What are people excited about? And then work to create um, kind of some, some structures in place where everybody knows that they have access to the tools that they need at every stage of readiness to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether that's exercise, healthy eating, mental health, all of those things together. And I, mean, I feel like it's the future. If you're, a, if you're a small business owner or a big business owner and you're not investing in your employees as people, mm -hmm. you're missing the boat and you're going to get left behind. They're human resources, you know, and yes. people think of that. They go HR. They don't even use the words anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think the words have value because they're exactly what it sounds like. Those are the humans that are your resources. Right. And you well, don't collect other resources. So why do you want to neglect that aspect of them right. and treat them like they're automated and they're yeah. not actual people? Well, I'm sure that you guys see in your work, working with individuals who are in the midst of legal issues, yeah. the impact sure. that that has on people's lives, the time that they spend dealing with those things. And they're doing all of that while also trying to keep their job, manage their family, be a person, and it's a lot. Yeah. And so any little thing that we can do to help make that easier, I, I feel like that's just part of our responsibility as people. Yeah. And I think honestly, because obviously I'm considering this, <laughs> I, I bet it would alert you to some uh, potential problems before they become actual problems. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big I could time. see tremendous value in that to an employer and as employee. I mean, I was an employee much longer than I've been an employer. So uh, I, I can see both of it. Who, who wants to um, ask Heather a question instead of me calling on you like I'm the teacher? Because <laughs> I'll do it. Oh, I'll go after you, Betsy. Go ahead. Hi, Betsy. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you remember me. We have a mutual friend, Dr. Karen Russell. You remember? Uh -huh. Okay, good. Yes. We hung out together at a birthday party once. Yeah, I um, remember. <laughs> <laughs> I live across the street from her. So um, I just saying about the um, the culture of employment and, and how important it is that employees are are well looked after. Because I've been doing it. So I feel like I have had a front row seat to situations where, where that's not the case, that's not the culture, and people are kind of swept aside. And um, I, I think so overlooked how important that is because people need things, and this goes for employees too, that's affirmation and appreciation. And if you don't Say that again, to... Betsy, let me stop you, sweet. You're um, cutting in and out. So I want to make sure we're covering it. You said you've been in situations, which I presume you're saying where uh, uh, human resources were maybe not valued or, or their well-being was not 
looked at to right. the degree Heather's talking about, and you feel like they need three things and you were saying them? Affirmation. Appreciation. What was that last one? Appreciation. 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 Affirmation and appreciation. Yeah. And validation. And validation. If it's a Dacian, they need it. <laughs> so I get it. Affirmation, you know, that's telling you, hey, you're on the right path, man. You got this. You're, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Nothing's wrong with you. It's possible for you. Validation. Um, I could describe that. And then um, the other one, Heather, you describe those three things and tell me how they fit into the concept of your coaching uh, framework. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. And those three things are so essential and also so accessible, you know, and it just, if we're willing to take a moment to pause and connect with the people that we're with, as humans, where they are, you know, not taking away the, what's the job title, what's the objective for the day. Yes, we need to get work done. We need to move this ship forward. You know, we need to do all of the things. But, you know, before that, you know, being able to to see somebody, appreciate who they are, validate that the way that they're feeling is valid and fair, and that they are allowed to have feelings. You know, you might not be able to to indulge them in their feelings. You might not be able to really to do what they want to have done, but you can appreciate the fact that they feel that way and affirm the fact that, that you are allowed to feel that. Mm -hmm. And those things all come together in um, a concept called psychological safety. And psychological safety really just means be believing that you are in a safe environment where you can be honest and you can, without, without fear of repercussion or um, some type of, of um, rep, you know, kind of consequences that are going to be what you would be in the category of being stabbed in the back. You know, being in an organization where you can raise your hand and ask a question without being ridiculed or talked about or somehow reprimanded for shaking the boat or making waves. And when you are in an organization where people have psychological safety, you have trust. And that type of psychological safety is created when you are in an environment where you're validated, you're affirmed, and you're appreciated. Mm -hmm. And I want to just kind of reiterate that that doesn't necessarily mean that you always get your way. Right. It means that you are heard and you know that everybody has heard you. They, they appreciate the fact that you came and you raised the flag, you raised your hand, you made the point and that the way that you are allowed to feel the way you feel. And that goes a long way. Yeah. This is something one of the women I was with in Belize, she was talking about when people express themselves and, and she said that she tells people, you're not allowed to have feelings about my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get to have my feelings. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, yeah. you know, I can see, I can see why somebody might say that. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I, I think we, we all have feelings and that's fair, but we can't all necessarily get what we want. Mm -hmm. Right. But you're allowed to feel it. Yeah. You get to be heard on it. You yeah. know, you, you don't have to be, uh, everybody doesn't have to say, oh, you're exactly right. I see it exactly the same way, but you get to be heard and you get yeah. to have your feelings. Even yeah. if the other person thinks they're just completely irrational and they can't imagine themselves feeling that way, um, that's not empathy, man. That's right. not what empathy is. So um, I think the world needs a whole um, correction on the empathy versus sympathy um, situation. But mm -hmm. let me get to Kia because she's been patiently waiting. What would you like to ask Healthy Heather today? Well, one, I'm excited that you're here because yeah. a lot of the things that you're discussing are a lot of the things that I am a huge proponent for, especially employee relations and all that big stuff, um, even down to creating like an innovation day where, you know, you're putting together those components of problem solving and the things that actually happen within a company. So it's so great to know that you're one of our resources here, you know, in Tallahassee to be able to do those type of things. But I do want to kind of go into your book because we've been talking about everything you talk about, which are, you know, the values, priorities, how to set boundaries, right. uh, and, you know, creating that vision for your life. So the happy, healthy you by Heather, 
how do you set those healthy boundaries? Because pretty much all of us on here are mothers, aunts, um, we're mentors, we're, we're, we have attorneys, and I'm in communication. We take on so many different hats. Mm -hmm. So how do you tell your clients or even us, how do we set those healthy boundaries to ensure that one, we're happy, and two, those that we're trying to ensure that are happy, especially even our clients um, and the things that we do for them. We want to make sure they're happy as well. But how do we set those happy boundaries? Yeah. And how do you enforce your boundaries? Yes. <sighs> That's the tricky part. And I think it's it's usually it's pretty easy to come up with what the boundaries should be, you know, and then what is what is a realistic expectation, and but then the tricky part is actually following through with it. Um, so yes, yeah, so my my book, Happy Healthy You: Breaking the Rules for a Well Balanced Life, is now out in stores, and it's a um, a compilation of fifty two of my favorite essays that I've written over the years. Um, at which I have expanded with some reflection questions and journaling prompts. So it's, you know, you can read one a week for a year or you can read them all in one weekend. I don't care. You can break the rules, but there's something in there for everybody. When it comes to, you know, your question about how do we create these boundaries? I think one of the most, one of the most important things that we can do in the very beginning is to get on our own team. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and just to remember that, that you and that, that you inside yourself are partners mm -hmm. and that, you know, there's that ongoing conversation that you're having with yourself. And if you can get on your own team and just partner up with yourself, then it makes it a lot easier to start to take care of yourself because instead of coming from a position of, I need to um, avoid temptation. I need to fight against this. I need to protect myself against that. You know, you're in what some would say is a scarcity mindset of there's not going to be enough. I need to protect myself and I need to, to keep myself away from those temptations. Mm -hmm. When you start to work as a partner with yourself, then you, you move into more of an abundance mindset where I have many options available to me and there are a lot of ways that I can be successful here. I know that I'm going to be able to, um, to deal with anything that comes my way. And so now I'm choosing options. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really powerful place yeah. to start. The next step that I really advocate for is paying attention to what works well and believe it we are conditioned to fix ourselves, you know? We are conditioned to look for ways that we are messing up mm -hmm. and to fix it. And I wanna flip that. Look for those times during the day when something is going well. Yeah. And make a note of that because you want to stay there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how I start almost all of my coaching sessions is asking what's going well right now? Yeah. What's fo what's this focus on what's working? And then in the next, some people think the next logical question would be, okay, so what's not working? No, <laughs> what's going well? What do you want more of? So that we're staying in this place where we're bringing in the things that are feeding us, that are working for us. The stuff that's not working is gonna leave on its own. Yeah. You know, the stuff that's not working is not gonna stay at a party where nobody's talking to them. Right. So believing what you hear about yourself, believing about what works for you and just continuing to ask, how do I keep this? Yeah. yeah. And that is, it's just a powerful place to start. Yeah. Our, when our, it comes to what? I, I, I was interrupting you. Please finish. Oh, no, I was just going to say the tricky part is protecting it. You know, like once you establish it, the tricky part is enforcing that. And, you know, and that's just, it just comes with practice, you know, yeah. awareness of, okay, I'm, I'm letting, I'm getting a little bit further away from where I, where I was. I'm not feeling as good as I was before. Let's go back to where things were good and just notice what could, what could I have done differently to, to stay there? Yeah. It's just trial and error and practice. Our, our law partner, Jimmy Basic, uh, 
ex explained his philosophy on that to me several years ago. And he, he used those exact words, the scarcity mentality, the abundance mentality. He lives his life in an abundance mentality. And honestly, I don't think there's a person on this panel who would disagree with that. I mean, he goes through life believing the best is, is happening and he's only going to get better. Yeah. And I mean, a deep abiding belief in that. And guess what? It's kind of the way his life goes. <laughs> and he's a pretty successful guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's got, he's firing on all cylinders uh, because he, he, he pretty much, you know, insists on it. You know, he's but just, he, so he doesn't, he doesn't entertain any otherwise. Yeah. 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 Who, who wants to ask another question or go next or make a comment? I do. Okay. So I wanted to ask again, I love all the tips and tricks and tools you're throwing at us. And so when you are helping people make a life balance and establish priorities and boundaries, what are kind of your standard tools that you use to help them delineate that, that and then follow, you know, the guidelines that they've made for themselves? You know, it really is a really custom process. You know, by the time we get to that point in, in a strategy of creating balance in your life, you know, we need to have first identified, you know, the vision, you know, where is it that we're going and then really connect with the motivators. Why is this important and why now? And mm. because there's going to be challenges along the way and we need to be able to connect right back to, you know, this is something that's really important and it's worth working on it because of this thing that I really care about. And then we have to reflect, we have to reflect and I, I think accept that we can't have it all at the same time, you know? And I, I think that we've been get, doing ourselves a disservice by, by telling ourselves that we can have it all and we can do it all. Um, because I think the reality is that we need to make some choices and priorities in our lives. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you cannot sample everything throughout the, the course of life. But I think it's, I think we set ourselves up for failure when we think that we can do everything all the time. Sure. And so um, some of the, the tools that I'll ask for are, you know, to spend a week in awareness with yourself and just notice, you know, where does my attention go and how did I feel about that? Mm -hmm. you know? And starting to get to know and really accept the realities of your life, you know, because remember we're working in reality. Mm-hmm. But then, but then also paying attention to, you know, where are things going well? And then, you know, where, where do I feel friction and where do I see an opportunity? And then come back from that time of awareness and identify, okay, how did that go? And of, of the events that happened during the course of my week, what are my non-negotiables that absolutely have to happen for me? What am I not willing to negotiate on. I have to eat food. I have, you know, I have to eat food. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have to have some privacy during the day, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, you could just kind of start whittling down to where, until you've got like, yeah, two or three things that are like, I don't go to bed until these things have happened because they're important to me. And mm -hmm. then creating the structures to be able to protect them. I love that. It makes me think of, <clears throat> so kind of journaling what I do at work. I've recently done this. I took a week and every single thing that I did at work, I tracked my time so that I could have that reflection to look back and see, you know, where am I spending my time? What things can I delegate? That sort of thing. And so that's what I'm envisioning doing, but instead of just in the work life, you know, expanding it to everything. I think that's right. brilliant. Yeah. And, and I'll you can get, go ahead. I, I, I want to talk about have it all, but you finish that thought. You, you don't, you can get really obsessive if you decide I'm going to spend the rest of my life tracking how I spend all of my time. So it's like, no, you only need to do it for like a few days. You know, you're going to get to know yourself pretty well, pretty quick, you know? And then the most important thing, believe what you know about yourself, you know, stop trying to fix or change who you are, go with who you are and believe what you know about yourself and nurture that so that you can mm -hmm. stay in that zone where you're feeling really like you're feeling like your best self. Yeah. Love it. Now I want to talk about this have it all because I'm going to uh, strenuously disagree with you on that. <laughs> um, okay, go for it. Me, the all thing, the having it all thing, that's a limiting belief. 
Mm -hmm. And you don't ever hear men talk about, boy, I wish I could have it all. So right. it's a limiting belief that is uh, quite specific to females and I want them to dump it. Um, and I think the problem is this, defining all. Yeah. Okay. Mm. A lot of all fails in having it all because you're trying to do shit that doesn't matter to you. Mm -hmm. You're doing what culture tells you a woman's supposed to do. You're doing what you think you're supposed to be doing as a mom and as a wife or as a daughter or as an employee or as an employer. So first of all, get out of your head define what you believe having it all is. Mm -hmm. And then you, once you find that out, I promise you there's a path for it. I promise you it's right in front of your face and a coach will help you find that. But I think the problem with having it all is in how we define it and how we value it. And it's a limiting belief, uh, deciding that you're not having it all because you're not doing something society tells you should be doing or your parents or whatever the hell, uh, no. No, I, I promise you that because I can have it all. I have it all. I've been doing it a while. It's fantastic. I love that. I, okay, so I agree with your disagreement of my definition of it all. So yeah, I, I'm on board. I think we need to define what is it all for you? Yeah. You know, and, and, and when you say have it all, you can't have it all. I think what we're really, the message is really this, honey, you're doing shit you don't even care about. You're doing, you're doing things that don't matter that aren't enriching your life and you're beating yourself up for not accomplishing it. Yeah. You know, just read redefine that. But yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. I really, really do. Some, I, I remember going through a phase of my life where I was just like, I was going, going, going. I was the energizer bunny and, you know, just, I was doing all the things and I, I felt really proud of myself that I was getting, I was doing so many things. And for me, that was like a badge of honor. It was like, look at all the things that I'm doing. But I was also, yeah, like, you know, who, we're, there's a Don't lot of us in that category. Yeah. And especially, you know, if you are a high achieving woman and a woman and you would, you enjoy accomplishments, yeah. then it's really tempting to just do a lot of things because you feel like you're getting a lot done. Yeah. But when I to that positive feedback of accomplishment, right? Yeah. But when I started to reflect on how I needed to really um, focus more on quality right. and quantity and define my all, I started asking, would anybody have noticed if I didn't do it? No, they would not. No. An, an example, I, I think a lot of women can relate to this one. I used to get so hung up on whether or not the socks were matched yeah, and like the laundry was folded, me too. you know, and now folding laundry is part of my self-care because I get the TV remote and I can sit down and binge on whatever I want to watch on TV and I'm folding laundry and that's my time. But there's other times when I'd rather like, you know, float in the pool or like go for a walk and do other things than do laundry. And so one shift that I made was realizing if I didn't match the socks, they still find socks. Yeah. <laughs> they still get socks on. And if they wear mismatched socks, DCF is not going to come take your children from you. <laughs> I found out that if I didn't fold the laundry and put it in stacks and then deliver it to, deliver it to their bedroom, they still got dressed in the morning. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was amazing. And so I stopped doing that stuff. Yeah. And Learn life is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, the laundry thing, I did this for years when I uh, had children in the house and uh, my husband, I had a bin in my laundry room where I would put the orphan socks Yep. with this twisted, irrational belief that ultimately their mates would appear. Right. <laughs> I still have that. I that happened have. about five to seven percent of the time. And so one day I just got this wave of empowerment and I took that bin and I went out to the garbage can and I dumped it. I said, we're doing a sock reboot. You got the <laughs> socks you got. You need some new socks. We can afford them. But this is what we're doing. I'm going to stop torturing myself every load because I end up with this, with this, um, uh, what do you, uh, an imbalance. Yeah. yeah. I can't reconcile my sock account. That was just rational, but I was trapped to that. I was trapped in it. And I was like, what the hell are you doing? There's not some like 
videotape, you know, that you're going to put me on the view and use me as an example of the shittiest mom. That's just never going to happen. But I was trapped. I was a trap of my own making. And I want to tell you a, a little experience that I had in this uh, retreat. And uh, it was one of those things, uh, that question that you're asked. Okay. All right, Dana, tell, uh, tell everybody what someone would say about you if they knew you. Then tell them what they would say about you if they really knew you. And then say what someone would say about you if you really, really knew you. Ooh. So I was like, oh, deep as hell. Right? So <laughs> one of the things I came up with is that I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> I said, I'm very hedonistic. I will blow off stuff that I should do in order to have fun. That's not actually true, true, but it's how I feel because I'm comparing myself to a time in my life where I was balling, man. There was nothing I couldn't do. I was, people were going, how is she doing this? How is she doing this? You know? And I learned that that is my ego talking. Your ego only knows your past. It doesn't know your present and it damn sure doesn't know your future, but it's a confining, limiting belief, which is I'm actually sitting down for a couple hours a day, you know, watching Netflix, cooking something inedible because I just wanted to see if I could do it, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm doing things that to me, I'm going, Dana, why aren't you reading that case? Dana, why aren't you reading that deposition? Dana, why aren't you, you know, watching a, a listen to a podcast on something that's going to grow the firm? Um, and then I just, I just said, you know what? I'm dumping that too. I'm dumping it. I'm not lazy. Right. You know, I'm meeting every obligation I have to other people. I get to do shit I like to do. Right. So talk about that. Talk about how we get trapped in these faulty beliefs and they become prisons of our own making. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, I, the first thing that comes to mind is something that I learned from a therapist a long time ago. Um, when I was talking, when I was, when I was, the conversation that I was having with her was about parenting. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, descriptions are instructions. And mm -hmm. descriptions are instructions. Mm -hmm. So the way that we are described are often ways that we internalize, we should then perform and mm -hmm. be. And so the framework that she was telling that to me was that the way I was described as a child then informed the way that I, I behaved and the way that I was describing my children then informed how they behaved. Now yeah. for me, when I was a child, the most important thing was being beautiful. I was praised for being beautiful. 100%. And that was the, that was what I Winning. heard. And I believed that the biggest contribution that I could make to the world was to be beautiful. And uh, guess who has an eating disorder? <laughs> you know, because, yeah, because you just, you decide that must be who I am. Yeah. It took a long time for me to appreciate the fact that, well, that's a very nice compliment, but you know, I'd also like to be intelligent. I'd also like to be a good friend, you know, and a, and a thoughtful, creative person. And so I think just tuning into the fact that, like you said, that your ego knows your past. Yeah. And we can reflect to how was I described and how did that tell me how to act? Uh. And how am I now in the position to where I can say, well, that was an interesting observation that they had. This is who I really am. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually the foundation of this book I've got going right now in my mind um, about that very dynamic. Uh, I had an uh, absent father. He op I always say he opted out of parenting. Um, but he would contact me every five years or something, whatever, and he would, I would hear his voice, and he called me Dana Lee, Dana Lee. And the first thing he would say, he goes, tell me, you're, are you still beautiful? Tell me you're still beautiful. And he goes, your feet didn't get big, did they? What, men don't like women with big feet. And, and since he was such an absent part of my life and I kind of fantasized about what he was, I made him bigger than he was. I always, you know, you know what children do when they have an absent parent, they create yeah. fantasies of why, about why they're not there. And they almost deitize that other person. It's, it's, it's a very, I mean, we can get deep into the therapy here, but, um, but in my mind, it was always told me, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how accomplished you are. If you're not pretty, you're not as valuable. Right. And that is a pathology for me. And I have to manage that. Right. Uh, so, so deep, 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 man. 
um, well, who on our panel wants to comment or if you want to follow up on that, Heather? Well, I just wanted to, to say that I, I want to emphasize that you know, the, the people who say those things are not trying to define that for you. You know, though many times those comments are coming from a place of love and compassion. Like I don't hold any grudge against anybody in my past who showered me with compliments or told me nice things about myself because that was coming from a place of love and compassion. It's how we internalize it, it, it that, that creates that that um, that monologue in our brain of like, this is now who I am. And so I, I just wanna name that, that you know, there's, there's usually not ill intent there. Yeah. It's how you take it. Right. You know, I, I had such little affirmation from such an important figure. I blew up the value of the comments. Yes, that, exactly. That distorted my self-concept. Um, yeah. uh, we wanna hear from uh, Betsy, Kia, Kimmy, who's got a follow-up? Allowed to participate again? Yes. Come in, Maverick. Coming in. A little sad when I was breaking up. Are you okay? Bye okay. again. Can you hear me? We yeah. can hear you. We could. Full of like the coolest thing you've helped somebody solve on your podcast. Oh yeah, what have you helped people solve on Heather Solves Everything? <laughs> so now Heather Solves Everything is a podcast about um, helping you know women like all of us, you know, just be able to face those big challenges in life. And I think that one of the most rewarding and um, universal is that voice of self doubt. You know, a lot of times it's called imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, where we tell ourselves, I'm not qualified to do that. Like, I don't, I, people might not think that my idea is very good, or um, I haven't done this, this, and this, therefore I'm not qualified to try this thing. And so being able to just kind of name that and, and look it in the eye and recognize that we're all making this up, you know, and be able to start to cultivate relationships with each other where we are cheering each other on and, mm -hmm. um, and encouraging each other to step out and do bold things and, and know that, you know, you don't have to be completely confident in yourself to try something new. You just have to be confident in this, in the fact that no matter what happens, you can deal with it. True. You know, and that's true. true resilience is, you know, everything's not always awesome, but I can deal. Yeah. You know, whatever happens in this situation, I might fall flat on my face and, you know, the camera might turn off and I might think, oh my gosh, why did I say that? I'm so embarrassed, but okay. So you can deal with that, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's true power. That's solving a problem. And look at what you've already undergone, experienced and dealt with. You're yeah. here. You made it. And it's, and that's the thing about worry and anxiety. It's easier said than done, but you worry about these things that never come to pass. And then something will happen, you know, out of the blue that brings you to your knees, mm -hmm. but you get up, you deal with it, you know, but, but that's why, you know, it's, it's so, it, like I think it's a self-imposed prison that we put ourselves in. Kia, your thoughts. So this month, along with many other national things that, you know, we celebrate is men's health month. So okay. I'm pretty sure most women are more apt to come and get coaching or because we're always wanting yeah. to get better and do better, right? So when you get those men coaches, which I'm sure all of you know our attorneys that work here, when they get the men clients, there's a different dynamic. You know, they're trusting them. Like you were saying earlier, there's building that trust. So I think I have like a two-part question. Is it harder to have that man be your client because you have to figure out a different strategy or is it easier to have, you know, the man as the actual client? Because women come in, we kind of have that, like, I can't fail, so I can't let you know that I can't fail, but I can only give you this much because I'm gonna pull back on this much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how does it work with those type of clients? Men. Do you, do you see a gender dynamic? Yeah. Right. 
I see a gen I see a gender dynamic in the way that men and women approach their goals. Now, with the kind of with the type of coaching that I work in, when a man comes to me as a client, it's typically health related, and mm -hmm. men typically take action on their health once they have seen a close friend or a family member have a some type of a scary situation. Their friend had had a heart attack. Their friend's been diagnosed with cancer. Like it is close to them. They, there seems to be like, not, I'm invincible until somebody close to me has a scary situation. And now suddenly I, this is close and I'm ready to take action on it. And so I noticed that men come with, um, with those types of, of goals that they want to incorporate. But what's fun is that, you know, I think that we have this perception that that men feel like they need to posture for each other, and maybe they do need to posture yeah, for each other. I wondered other. about that. <laughs> I find that you know men and women want the same thing. They want to live a life where they feel <laughs> we're going to go right back to it, affirmed, appreciated, and validated. And I, I think that everybody wants to carve out space to take care of themselves, you know, whatever that means for them at that time of their life. But I think that's a really interesting observation about women having this, I can't show any weaknesses. I have to, you know, because I think that's definitely a true thing um, that, that we do for each other. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of women feel like they're already so vulnerable. They're not going to just cough up another vulnerability to be used against them. Absolutely. You know, I'm not going to admit it. I've already got enough of them. I'm not going to add to it. I'm not going to pile on. Right. I think it's helpful to set the expectation early. Sometimes people will ask when they come to a coaching session, they'll ask, what are you going to make me do? It's like, I'm not going to make you do anything. If I, if I had that much power, I wouldn't be here in Tallahassee. Like, right. <laughs> I'm making millions. It, I'm here to help. You know, like you tell me, you tell me what you want. And, yeah, and I'm really here fun. to help you get what you want. Mm -hmm. I love that. You know, it's, it, that's an empowering position right there we have got to wrap up you know we could be doing this for another two or three hours and I would like you to uh, I, I do want to talk to you about some you know firm type stuff I think it could be very very helpful and valuable but I want to give everybody on the panel a shot at uh, one last comment or question before we wrap up today and I have my own of course but I'll <laughs> who wants to pop up I'll go ahead okay um I was just thinking I once had a friend tell me to change my thinking instead of saying, oh, I have to get to say, I get to, because uh -huh. I was talking about how I was struggling to make time to exercise. And so I was like, oh, if I just, I just have to get there. I just have to go to the gym or the class. And, and she was like, why don't you think about like, I get to go do that. You know, I get to experience that. And so I, uh, it just makes me think about that. Everything you talked about today. Yeah. I ask that question a lot also, and I think it's really helpful to be honest with yourself about what is the purpose of exercise in my life right now? now mm -hmm. I had a conversation with a client today who was like, I need to get to the class. I need to get to the class. I need to get to Orange Theory. I need to do whatever. And it was never working. It wasn't clicking in. And I asked her, what's the purpose of exercise for you right now? She's like, I just really want to create a consistent routine. You know, I, I just really want to do something every day for movement because it makes me feel better. It's like, well, then do you need to go to Orange Theory for that? No. Mm. You know, I like, love that. Bring it back to the purpose. Because yeah, the bring purpose it back to motivate. why am I doing this in the first place? Right. Mm -hmm. And then right. it's something you're excited to do. Is it for health or because you feel guilty because you're not doing it? You right. know, that right. sort of thing. Good, great question. Kia, what about you? I would um, have to say thank you for being here, of course. Um, you. Coming from a journalistic background, I think you are definitely doing amazing. We are all trying to get where you are with everything that you have, all the accolades. But my last question would be when you're closing a session and you're feeling as though you're, you finally broke something, like how, what do you give them when they leave? Like what nugget or what gem do you give them in order to say or keep them coming back or keep them on their you know, path yeah too. or feeling as though okay that was a, that was successful and now I can really go and do it because you can say all the things but sometimes those last words is what stick with people so what do you what's that nugget or gem you leave them with I get them to say it <laughs> what 
<laughs> I asked them, what, what resonated with you today? What is still in your mind? Got it. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Turn it back on them. You know, because the whole point of it is, is remembering that you have all the power you need to live the life you want. Yeah. Your choice. Yep. Um, uh, Betsy, why don't you give us a word that we can hear every four or five words? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I have I have to thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask two questions. One for me and one for uh, Betsy. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I just want to make a comment about your journalism. Um, you uh, write for the Democrat, you know, for our, our local our local paper here, and I and I enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is this: talk about meditation and journaling, and here's why. Okay. I just can't seem to get it together. Okay. I can't. I can't. First of all, even if I did journal and write it down, I can't read my own damn handwriting. So I've gotten to where I will dictate things that are on my mind or things I want to just get out of my body and out of my brain because I'm ruminating or I'm about to start. Uh, so I think journaling maybe can take many forms, but is there a way to do that correctly? Number one. And number two, meditation. Um, I, I get so much out of it when I do it, but I just can't seem to find a way to incorporate into incorporate it into my day at a particular time. And I'm sure that's just a lack of discipline and creativity on my part, but talk about journaling and meditation, your position on them. Well, so journaling, you know, I, I think it, it's the same as the exercise thing. Like, what is the, what is it that you want from that? Like, why are you approaching it? What is it that you want from it? And a lot of times the purpose of it is awareness, you know, so does it have to be written down? Maybe it just, maybe it is dictated. Maybe it, it's, it's spoken to a friend. Maybe it's sung in the car. You know, it's just whatever the goal is, like, what is it that I need from this? And then, you know, how can I get that? So for me with journaling, it's either awareness of, like, I always want to keep people in that positive loop. So like journaling, what went well? So we stay in that mindset. And then also, um, you know, just kind of that free form of like, blah, I'm just going to let say all the words. Mm -hmm. And, and so don't worry about whether you're doing it right. Worry about whether you're getting what you wanted from it. You ever heard of, um, you ever heard anybody suggest that talking to yourself is kind of how you're doing that? Mm. Yeah. 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 I think people are always ashamed to say they talk to themselves. I'm telling you, I have a fantastic relationship with me. Good. We talk all the time. <laughs> I live I alone. Wonder, I drive yeah. alone. We have fantastic conversation. I, I like to think that I am cracking up somebody at Google because if my phone really is listening to me, I hope they're entertained. I oh, hope they're getting some tidbits because I'm, I'm giving them a show. I know my phone's listening to me because everything I talk about pops up in my feed. You want to go to this trip? You want to buy those shoes? Here you go, honey. Yeah. Um, and then what, what do you think about the meditation? Part? Meditation. I love meditation. Now I am not an expert on meditation. I, um, I refer to my friend, Stacy Turknet, who I love her. is, oh, she's fantastic. And I, 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 she is the, the expert in my eyes. Um, what I have gained from meditation is, is remembering that meditation, and this is something I learned from Stacy, that meditation can happen in the car. Meditation can happen where you're sitting down right now. You know, it's, I think that there's a lot of value for having that consistent space for yourself to just kind of ground. But if you don't have that, you can, you can just bring yourself into a place of, of mindfulness and, and, and get the benefit of it where you are. And so I think it just knowing that you want it is really helpful and, and it creates the space for it to show up and then just look for the opportunities and take them. Yeah. What, one of the things I do is what, what I want from meditation is to check out of everything else for a long enough period of time to not feel anxious about it, and to feel replenished, refreshed, rejuvenated to when I come back, I'm ready to go. And mm -hmm. for me, I like to drive back and forth from work to uh, my house at the coast, hashtag privilege. But I like that because I get about a 45 minute, 50 minute drive 
-hmm. and I will listen to a podcast. I may listen to meditation music or whatever, but I'm not thinking about another damn thing other than that. And to me, that's what meditation was. All the, you know, you're relaxing your head and your shoulders, whatever. That's all great. And it makes me feel good. But they're talking about breathing and whatever and floating. I couldn't stay focused on that. I go <laughs> back to the other things that are bothering me. But if I find one thing that I enjoy that, that I can concentrate and focus on, that will do the thing I'm seeking for mediation to do. And that is to remove myself from the, the daily right there. So yeah. uh, Thank you so much, Heather. I want to um, tell you what a, a breath of fresh air you are. You're very encouraging. Every time I spend time around you, I very I leave feeling very optimistic about the world and the people living in it. Mission that's, accomplished. That's a good compliment, right? Yes. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you so much, Kia Thomas, our PR director. Thank you, Betsy Brown and Kimmy Hogan, my law partners, and thank you, Heather Fusile. Thank Fusile. you for having me. I almost want to sing that. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here with us. Always catch her, her healthy, I mean, her um, uh, Heather Solves Everything uh, podcast, Healthy Heather, pick up her book, reach out to her. Um, if, if she can't help you, I'm sure she could refer you to somebody who can or put you on the right path. So thank you for being with us. Everybody follow us, uh, contact us on the Empower Plant or at Facing Brooks. I'm Dana at facingbrooks.com and we can get you the contact information. We'll post it later. But uh, thank you for another fantastic episode of the Empower Hour brought to you by the Empower Plant by Facing Brooks Personal Injury Lawyers. We'll see y'all next Thursday. Thanks, thank Heather. You. Thanks.